Greetings from the Chalcedon Foundation. This is Andrea Schwartz with a long overdue edition of the Law and Liberty podcast. My last podcast was in November of 2014 when I interviewed Bill Hyde of Heirloom Audio Productions, the outfit that brings G.A. Henty historical fiction to life with audio dramas. Now, over eight months later, I tracked down Bill Hyde again because of the newest release with Lee in Virginia. Now, some of you may not be familiar with audio theater. Well, it's a lot like being read to, except there are sound effects, music, and individual performers take each of the roles. What's great about this format is that it allows children to tap into and exercise their imagination by letting them create the visual images to go along with what they hear. Now this is true anytime you read to a child, but what this does is it makes it more exciting. As the folks who put together these audio dramas like to say, they really are in the movie business, except the movie is playing in the child's mind, generated by the child's imagination. So along with their first production, which was Under Drake's Flag, about Sir Francis Drake, and then the second, In Freedom's Cause, about William Wallace, a third audio drama has been added to the collection. With Lee in Virginia, is set during the Civil War, telling the story from the perspective of a young boy who grows into maturity as he fights under Robert E. Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. The war between the states was a tumultuous time in our nation's history and has had lasting ramifications. There are many themes and lessons that are pertinent to our day, and this audio production addresses many of them. I think you'll find the discussion I recently had with Bill Hyde both entertaining and instructive. Enjoy. Bill for joining me today and it's always a pleasure because you're my friend but when you have a new project it's a a great excuse for me to share my friendship with you with other people so that you can then become their friend. (laughs) You're welcome it's always great to be with you as well Andrea so thanks for having me. Okay so back when you first started your bringing the Henty novels to audio theater. You started with Sir Francis Drake, and I fell in love with the format and your perspective to bring history to life so that there isn't a distorted view of not only the Christian part of history, but the fact that young people were not only expected to be responsible they were given lots of examples of people who had been responsible. Does that sort of sum up how you picked which Henty novels you would bring to life? Yeah, I would say that's true. We, we, we like the stories generally that, that really have kind of a guy that, that had a biblical faith and that we can kind of tell the backstory of that. Henty, as we said before, is one of those guys that lived during the Victorian period. His assumption, his presuppositions, if you will, were that everyone knows that Christianity is the only real religion and the only real belief system that that is cogent and makes any sense and so forth. And so a lot of times he didn't really talk about the faith of of the individual as much as we would now, being in a bit of a post postmodern, post-Christian, if you will, world. And so we love those stories where young men can be mentored, and women as well, can be mentored by people that we think are real heroes and learn, you know, just uh, learn from uh, learn from the example. And that's that's kind of the, the pattern that we've tried to achieve. The most recent one that is available for people to buy Um, And we're not really going to go too much into the story of it because I don't want to give it away and I want people to buy it. And they can buy it, by the way, at the website with LeeInVirginia.com. 
and it brings to life the period surrounding Robert E. Lee as the general of the Army of Northern Virginia during the war between the states. But the interesting part to me is Henty was not an American, so he didn't particularly have an axe to grind. He wasn't a northerner. He wasn't a southerner. And the story itself was written a good 25 years after the end of the war. Why do you think G.A. Henty thought it was important to tell this story? Well, that's really a great question because I think just like the Tocqueville came to this country and kind of wanted to know about the freedom thing, and I think Henty was one of these guys that he wanted as a storyteller. He came later. He really wanted to try to figure out why we had to lose 600,000-plus lives on the issue of slavery when Wilberforce and company kind of put it away without firing a shot. So he was very curious about such things, and I think he should be. And, And I love what you said about his neutrality. He really didn't have a dog in that particular hunt, but he just kind of wanted to know what was going on. And, um, I think it makes for a really good story because he's not, you know, in, in our situation today with respect to education, I mean, you know this with all the homeschool stuff that you do, generally in wars, and it's the case in our war, you know, that people that win the war write the history. So most of the history that you get in this country, and I would be sad to say even a lot of uh, the Christian curriculum is sadly wrong about the perspectives, but as I said, Henty came in with this, with this uh, objective pr- perspective on it that really makes for a nice, clean story. Right. You know, it's funny. I grew up, I'm a Yankee, I grew up in New York, and I can remember learning about the Civil War, and even as a child, I said, it, this doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense that if, in fact, slavery was the only issue in the war, why would so many people who supposedly hated slaves or hated black people, why would this war have been fought? And I think one of the things the drama brings to life is it wasn't, yes, slavery was the backdrop and it was an issue, but it wasn't the issue that made men like Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, Jeb Stewart decide that they were going to put their life on the line and sacrifice so much. Yeah, and it wasn't really the issue for Lincoln. If you, you know, what's odd is I'll ask people if they've ever read the Emancipation Proclamation, and most people haven't really read it. They just assume that it says what the history books today, the secularized books say that it says. But what's interesting, Andrew, is that the, the proclamation itself didn't free any slaves in the North. They didn't free Ulysses Grant's slaves or Mrs. Lincoln's slaves. They freed slaves in the South. And, you know, re- are you ready for this? They only freed, freed slaves in the South who who were in territory that the Southern uh, Confederate forces held. So even in the South, if, for example, one of the Northern generals had territory in the South, the the slaves weren't free in that territory, even if it was in one of the Confederate states. So that should get everybody's spidey senses tingling a little bit and say, what's going on with that? You know, I thought this thing was, a, was, was all the way across the board, but that's just not the case. What Lincoln was trying to do was destabilize the Confederate forces by encouraging blacks to rebel in the South. I don't think he really cared so much about the blacks themselves, that's sad to say that. And I'm, I'm from Illinois, so it's the land of Lincoln. It says that on our license plates. The story's not the way it was presented in, in all the right. history books. And on top of it all, there was a big effort to keep Europe out of the war. And so the Emancipation Proclamation was a propaganda effort to say, are you really going to come in on the side of people who enslave people? So as you said, it was very much a tactic, but it didn't really accomplish anything other than now, 100 year plus later, we think that the Emancipation Proclamation freed somebody. Yeah, it really didn't have much of an effect. And, and I read someplace that uh, Ulysses Grant, even after the war, I think Lee freed the slaves that he inherited through the Custis family 
1862. After the war, Ulysses Grant still had some slaves and with his wife, and I think he had one of his own. And when someone asked him, you know, why don't you free your slave? The war is over and, you know, all of this. He said, good help is hard to find. Interesting. Our history books have painted a picture that it was all about southern people hated blacks and northern people loved them. And yet what this book brings forth, and it's, he, he did his research, he didn't just make this up whole cloth, had to, I'm talking about, that there was a real love and a feeling of family in the midst of the institution of slavery that it was difficult to dislodge because it was so ingrained. Yeah, for, for such a long period of time, and I think it was hard to, to decouple from that. You had families, entire families, you know, living with other families and in some cases going to church with those families. And so that became, there's a lot of letters that exist that kind of tell, tell great stories about this, but it wasn't just a cut and dry, it's not a bumper sticker issue, as you say. There was a lot of, a, a lot of issues with, with Southern friendships and there was a lot of cases where Southerners moved north and after the war, and, and their former slaves just moved with them because they didn't know what to do. And again, this harkens back to part of the issue. President Lincoln and some other folks felt like it was a good thing to set, you know, they wanted to send the slaves to back to Africa and other places. Not everybody in the South felt the same way. Some people tried to establish colonies, and some of that was good, but if there was a lot of confusion about what to do because not everybody bought slaves. Like, for example, for example, Ulysses Grant's wife had slaves, and they were inherited slaves. That's up in north near Galena, where I live. In the south, Robert E. Lee, as I said, inherited these slaves. So it just wasn't as simple as just saying it's over and flipping a switch. That wasn't the issue. At the time, Rush Dooney brings out the fact in his American history tapes that I think one in 17 – he mentioned, were the actual Southerners that actually owned slaves. One in 17. And you had the Virginia vote, Andrea, that came within a couple votes of abolishing slavery in the Virginia House right before 1860. So this thing was, wasn't was the story that you've been presented. And it, it, it truthfully, as Rush says, you know, this didn't have to happen. And so the, the perspective that you have to sort of adopt and say, okay, if it didn't have to happen, if other countries had managed to handle the issue of slavery without a war, was there some other agenda that made it so this was a convenient issue to hang it on? And now, as I said before, in retrospect, reduce everything about that time and that conflict to racism as opposed to the difference between local government and an overreaching federal government. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, Otto Scott has had written this wonderful book, The Secret Six, and that really tells a lot about other pressures that were created to make things happen in a very fast way. So I think this this Unitarianism enforced a kind of existentialist idea that I want to remember remember uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. I want an Oompa Loompa, and I want one now. You know, and, and I think that the abolitionists, the Northern abolitionists, were pressuring Lincoln, and I think they really wanted to extinguish slavery by force and to do it in a in a huge blow, a, a huge striking blow to make a point. That's the religion, and I mean, it's this Unitarian religion that they believed wasn't so passive. Most Unitarians that I know are pretty passive, but the Unitarianism that financed um, John Brown wasn't very friendly. You know, I often compare it when I'm trying to explain this issue to people, whether it was students I've taught or my own children or just a general discussion. Um, for Christians who are pro-life and we have either inherited a world or um, saw our, our culture change to the point now where it's legal to kill children and Depending on who wins the battle, it's either about we don't want people to murder or some people don't want people to have a choice. Abortion is not about choice. That's just 
the same way to take an issue and elevate it and take the attention off the fact that people are being murdered every day. The South, as you pointed out, could have ended slavery and was actually on the path to do so. A lot of the ministers wanted to, and they were working on it. But having this situation where the states felt as though the federal government was going to use this issue to come in now and take over in areas where it shouldn't, basically, as you put it, set the stage for 600,000 people dying. Well, again, I think that there's a lot of takeaways, obviously, from this, but you know those folks that preach this pacifism, I think, when they get stirred up, they want to use force. And, and again, I have to be careful in saying this, but I think there are similarities when you have Unitarianism. It's very similar to the, the Unitarianism there. It's very similar to the Unitarianism in Muslim states. You don't have an issue of the equal ultimacy of the Trinity. You don't have a way to reconcile plurality with oneness. And so the only thing you can do is pick up a club. And that's the wonderful thing about Trinitarian Christianity is it, it is the basis for freedom. And I think when the Unitarians won this, I think that it really kind of changed our country forever. And we're, we're living in a, in a world today that really is a byproduct of the of the philosophical victory that that they won at the Civil War. Now, one of the things that the audio drama does, it really, the main character in this drama is not Robert E. Lee, even though the title of it is with Lee in Virginia. What Henty does is he tells the story through the eyes of a young man and his, I say adventures, but it starts off being very, very idealistic He's a son of a man who was killed in military service. He now will inherit his family's plantation, but he wants to do his duty. And duty is a big thing that comes up in this story over and over again. And so Robert E. Lee becomes the person he looks up to, and yet there are things about Robert E. Lee that confuses him. He doesn't quite understand Robert E. Lee's willingness to rely on God at first for how this war is going to end. Yeah, I think there's a little bit of all of us in that story where we we wonder just what's the relationship between my effort and, you know, do I have to do it all myself? Uh, where, where does God in all of this, where does God fit in? And that really is part of the tension that makes it interesting. And the young man, of course, learns throughout the story to trust in God more and more all the time. We bit of progressive sanctification there in some sense. These stories, these empty stories, and this one in particular, really about growing up and becoming mature, and in this case, becoming a mature young man and being responsible and learning this. And I think this is the most important idea. This is Stonewall Jackson's idea, but it kind of leavened all of the South including Lee, his favorite phrase, and we have Kirk Cameron playing um, Stonewall, duty is mine, consequences are God's. So duty is ours, duty is mine, consequences are God's. A win is trying as hard as you can, but the outcome is not in your pay grade. The outcome is not your deal. It's somebody else's deal. It's God's deal. So what's a win look like? We kind of redefine that, and I think it's healthy for kids today, for parents, to really try to make sure they raise their kids in a way that their kids understand the theme that we present in the story. Like if if your kids are playing, you know, your daughter's a competitive, very competitive golfer. If if she had to beat everybody all the time and you were browbeating her about winning, 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 instead of just doing her best in each event, I mean, that wears people down, that wears kids down, that wears a nation down. In this case, If you do your duty, that's all you need to do. That's kind of the theme. Try as hard as you can, then let it go. Right, and one of the quotes that surfaces a number of times within the the drama is the quote from Robert E. Lee that you should do your duty in all things. You can never do more, and you should never wish to do less. That's that. Those are good marching orders for not only young people but for adults as well. 
Yeah, really, that's just that's uh, quite a thing to carry with you everywhere you go. I have a lot of young men and women that have heard this and kind of add that to their little um, to their emails at the bottom. It's so profound that I think again, that's it doesn't matter how old you are. That's just good medicine. And Robert E. Lee is a good example when the scripture says that a man of honor, even his enemies respect him. It's interesting that you don't ever, at least I've never encountered, too much bad-mouthing of Robert E. Lee. He certainly is a conundrum to people because how can you have a Christian man who actually fought the war against the union that he said he loved, but he was the first to admit that he didn't want to go to war. He didn't like war. I think one of the quotes is, good thing that war was so terrible, otherwise we would grow too fond of it. He almost took personally every person who died on the battlefield on the part of the South, but they also prayed for those who were going to engage them from the enemy side. Yeah, yeah, he was very compassionate, very thoughtful, and I don't don't think that he took this lightly. But I think the takeaway, too, on it on a kind of a political level is the realization that during Lee's time, certainly during our founder's time, but even during Lee's time, Virginia was kind of considered more of a country and not sort of relegated to minor league statehood with a, with a gigantic federal government. That's the legacy Lincoln gave us. But that's not Lee's perspective. He couldn't attack really what became his, his, his comments back. Uh, Plenfield Scott really, really can't attack my own country, my own Virginia. That's where I'm from. That's my land. So we don't tend to think of things that way, but as you can kind of get your your feet into his shoes a little bit in this story, you start to realize that, you know, you can't pull somebody out of their historical context and, you know, plop them down onto the Rachel Maddow show and expect it to all make sense. It's going to be confusing. It's going to be choppy. And, and when you understand that the first choice to lead the Union Army, they went to Lee and asked him to do it. In light of the fact that we have all this talk about the Confederate flag and it should come down, and I I don't think a lot of people even understand what the issues were, even the ones who were defending the Confederate flag. I don't think they understand it from a biblical worldview. Yeah, well, the Confederate flag in and of itself is an interesting thing because we talked before about in Freedom's Cause, we talked about Wallace, but that X is the cross of St. Andrew, and so... That's the same X that's on Scotland's flag. That's kind of, those are Wallace's people. In many cases, cases, these middle colony people were Wallace's <laughs> genetic progeny anyway. So it's it's kind of the same war. You're fighting tyranny uh, in Scotland. You're fighting tyranny, the encroachment of a federal government here. And I think that the flag's probably misunderstood, as you say, quite well. But I will say this that's really kind of interesting to me. When... After the war, there were a lot of Confederate veterans that they were bitter, as you could imagine, and there was a lot of carpetbaggers that went south, and uh, we know there was a lot of turbulence during that period of time, especially after President Lincoln was assassinated and leaving a big hole there. But a lot of Confederate veterans put their, their battle flag out on their porches and in their yard, and Robert E. Lee said something that I think really maybe is is the best position. In his case, he said, take your flag down. Our country needs to heal, and it's not going to heal if you continue to keep the position that you think that you have. We lost this war. And so he was an advocate for taking the flag down, and he made sure not only that, he made sure that when he died, that in his will, you couldn't have, he didn't want any flags on his casket at his service. He didn't want the Stars and Stripes. He didn't want the battle flag of Northern Virginia. He didn't want the Confederate flag flying anywhere because he thought people would, would take that and use it in a way that, that maybe showed a lack of grace. So he was very thoughtful that way. And I think, Maybe very much like President Lincoln, again, who, I, who who's not probably one of my great heroes, but I think there was a sense that Lincoln wanted things to heal, and I think there was a sense that Lee wanted things to heal as well. Right. And, and one of the parts that I thought were really touching, because 
I ended up listening to this in my car. And when I got through the first disc, I put in the second disc because this is a full two hours plus of – it made me want to drive around a bunch so I could get more into the story. But I ended up <laughs> listening to the second disc twice just because it was still in my car and I had a long car drive ahead of me. And I was really touched by a couple of things. One, how the young man coming face-to-face with death of people who were close to him matured. He, he almost went into it – kind of like kids who play video games and kind of like, oh, this is exciting, we get to be soldiers. And then the reality of what was happening and what, you know, on either side, there's an exchange between him and uh, a northern soldier who is now guarding him because he's been taken captive, and they're both sort of consoling each other for people that they've lost. And I thought that was, um, it was done really well, and it takes some of the excitement you might say out of oh war and being a soldier and it brought it down to reality people die they don't come back they don't get up again like they do in the video games or they do in the movies where you have actors playing it people die yeah and they don't even die in a kind of you know movie star way that we we used to see john wayne and other people die i mean this is um this is horrible stuff death is hell as as they say and um we try to make that point. It's a family thing, so we have to kind of walk the line a little bit. But we really did, you know, go a little bit extra to try to make sure that there were those real interactions because this was a brother against brother type of war, and there were all kinds of people in this war from different places. One of the things I want to say too, Andrew, that I think is important, and, and especially for our listeners here, is you know, people liberals and conservatives, you have a hard time trying to find people to embrace God's law, even when we're running into the world that we're running into today. I think more than ever, we need to look at God's law. But, you know, if you decouple yourself from God's law, you also decouple yourself from the laws against kidnapping and slaving, which are capital offenses. So you go to Deuteronomy and go to Exodus and you find uh, something more vicious than any liberal would try to paint on slavery. It's a capital offense. And so that's just, I mean, I would think that God's law would be the friend of every liberal that's against slavery, and but it's not. And so we have a uh, an interesting problem when we try to come up with a standard for ethics, right? You, We've got a standard for ethics that we can all understand. So the conversation when, when everybody goes to do apologetics on this issue is, look, I know why I'm against slavery. In fact, the Bible says it's a capital offense. But I guess, Mr. Atheist, I'm wondering why you're against it. And we've got to start asking questions like that and forcing people into you know, finding out their, their epistemological core, as Van Til and Rush would probably say, but this was another tool for that type of thing because we, we, we had got God's law in this, protecting black people. And, and if we would have had better theology, if we would have had uh, people looking at God's law in this country earlier, we wouldn't have even gone down this road. So we got to blame the South to some degree, too. But what do you do with a guy like Robert E. Lee? He never bought a slave in his life. He inherited slaves through the Custis family, George Washington's adopted son, and He's got to figure out a way out of it. So we have to be graceful to those people as well. It wasn't that easy because, for example, because of the lack of adherence to God's law and the man stealing, which this is how the slaves got there. Very few of the people who fought the war had actually gone out and kidnapped someone from another country. By that time, the trade had pretty much stopped. And there were people who were rotten to their slaves, but they were also rotten to other people, their their wives and their children. So it's not like they were wonderful people to everybody else and they were rotten to their slaves. But the institution was hated by a lot of people, but they didn't know how to undo it because the country really wasn't ready to receive people who were not educated. And so it was a process. I think that the takeaway here is for parents – they should listen to this drama because their history is probably really shaky on this period of American history. And we can certainly suggest after they listen to it 
that there are some resources, certainly that the Calcine Foundation has in terms of American history, but there are a, a number of books, and I'm sure that your website will refer people to for further study, um, because your goal is to have American history or world history or Christian history told accurately, but in an engaging way that the whole family can enjoy. Yeah, well, at first I would recommend getting Russia's world history and his American history. It's invaluable. I mean, you, you absolutely have to have that. But we do uh, uh, include a curriculum where we kind of force some of these issues and try to try to bring some of these things that are that are sore spots out into the surface where they you know where they can be looked at, examined, and dealt with biblically. I think that's you want to heal slavery. You want to heal. Um, slavery, you know, where where people own slaves, you're gonna you're gonna use the Bible to to change that. I think that we're in a country right now where we have a lot of people that are slaves spiritually. You know, all you gotta do is read the news, and there's almost demonic behavior. I would say not almost, but but demonic behavior that exists today. It's slavery, plain and simple, and, and the kind of slavery that that Paul talks about as well. Then we've got probably uh, another problem of equal proportion and that's we really have gone from the personal ownership of slaves to state sponsored slave slavery and you know we are all to some degree participants in that and i think really what president lincoln did was expand the size of the plantation in some sense because boy sharecroppers never paid what we pay in taxes federal state county you know, that's we're in really, if you look at it just from a historic perspective, uh, as far as taxes are concerned, we're really slaves. Not only that, with the taxation, as you said, that we end up being paying more than God requires even. God requires a tenth of what we make. The state requires more than that. But just the fact that Americans are so willing to be in debt that – Scripture, again, isn't being followed because the Scripture says there should not be debt for more than six years. Even a person who had gone into bond service at the end of six years was required to be released. So you're right. The South as a whole didn't do enough to, to make it so that the abolitionists couldn't win the, the, the point and, and, and precipitate the war. And I think that's one of the things, that was the second point that I said that was really quite touching, how at the end, when Robert E. Lee makes the decision that he's got to surrender, he had such respect from his men and loyalty that they would have kept fighting until the last guy was standing, but he had the grace of God to say, no, we've lost this contest. Um, didn't mean that he gave up his principles, but he wasn't willing to just have needless loss of life yeah in, in at, at Appomattox it's really unprecedented the type of surrender that existed there Ulysses Grant basically said to Lee I, when he handed his sword we handed his sword to him I'm not taking Robert E. Lee's sword and so we gave him his sword back I don't know of any place in history where that's true where you know where that same thing is is has happened so this is really really an important point so then he takes his sword, he gets back on his horse, he gets on traveler, and he rides back into the camp, as you say. And his men see him come, and they start to line up. And you know what they say, should we hit him again? Should we hit him again, General? They were willing to do anything. And these were people that weren't wearing shoes always. They probably represented General Washington's men. In some case, they were uh, underarmed and poorly clothed and didn't have the ammunition or anything that the North had, yet because of his leadership, because of the sterling nobility that this man had, he had folks that were willing to follow him to anything, to do anything. And that's a good lesson, too, whether it's at home and church in your community, just being obedient and trying to be, you know, that humble boldness that we had. People are going to follow you, and they're going to, because they're going to respect you, because they know that you're a man or woman of integrity. We had that, and it's just, it's an amazing and remarkable thing that we would even see a man like Robert E. Lee, and he really was not a perfect man, and, and, but he was someone that would admit that he wasn't a perfect man, which I think gave him even more power. I think so, too. 
So what's next on your agenda? What's the next radio drama that we can expect? Oh, I'm excited about this one because I got a piece of this out of uh, the Russia's Institutes, the first one, where I found that he had found a piece, one of the professors that he quoted had found a piece from the laws that Alfred had implemented into England. And so I took a little bit of that, and we're doing Henty's The Dragon and the Raven. It's a story about King Alfred, another guy that you, if you study him enough, you will say, unbelievable. I can't even hardly imagine that a guy like this even existed because of how he was able to conquer the Danes, the Vikings, as they came down, raping, pillaging, looting, and then how he was able to assimilate them, the ones that wanted to surrender, how he was able to assimilate them, baptize them, let them eat at his table, call them brother. It's a most remarkable story that should be out uh, out uh, right in time for Christmas. Any people that we would know in that drama? Well, my friend John Reese Davis is in it. We've had a lot. A gal from um, Helen George from Call the Midwife is in it. Some of the people we've got the guy that played William Wallace, Stuart Pendrins, back in it because we love Stuart's voice. You know, Alfred was fond of of gathering his men around and going and looking at the Psalms and trying to find war Psalms here, and he would you know, sing when the enemy comes in, roaring like a flood, and he would get everybody whipped into a frenzy biblically before a battle. And the truth of it is, he became fiercer because like Robert E. Lee, like a lot of Cromwell, like a lot of these men, he trusted in God and he was not afraid of man and he was not afraid of Vikings. And that gave him an incredible power to go forward without any fear because he just didn't care whether he died or not. He didn't want to, but if that was God's plan for him, that was God's plan for him. So there's there's some remarkable traits among these great people that are all the same. You know, they're willing to draw a line and they're covenantal and they they say, I won't go past this line even if even into death. And those are good lessons for today because we, we kind of get back to that kind of thing. We're slipping fast and, and we really need great examples in history that we can say, gee, this guy pushed the Vikings back with smaller numbers, with with um, some some superior tactics and so forth. And he was able to do it. And then he established law, of course. You had the Shire. You had decentralized government with Alfred. He created the county system and uh, tried to decentralize. And you know, jury of, of – if you don't have Alfred, you don't have a jury of, of your peers. And you don't have common law. And he started the English Navy and – I could go on and on and on, and hopefully I'll get a chance to actually do that with you next time. Yes, indeed. Well, there's a good point, because, first of all, if we want to be successful in battle, whatever the battle may be, full-scale war or just the cultural battles that we face, we have to be on God's right side. Uh, And by that I mean we've got to know the law, we've got to apply the law. These men were faithful in their understanding of Scripture, and they were men of character and integrity. So you wouldn't have adulterers in the bunch, or you wouldn't have people who were trying to defraud others. You had someone who had real care and compassion. Well, the lesson here is if you want God's blessing in your efforts, then you need to live according to his word. Now, some might say, well, if that's the case with the, the, these godly men, how come God allowed the South to lose the war Well, the bigger picture is that the judgments of God were on the country itself, and our task now, you know, 100 plus years later, is to uh, look at each other as people in God's image and work towards sharing the reality that those who follow God's law will be blessed and those who don't won't. And so instead of being characterized and allow our characters, the characterization of us to be, oh, you're hateful people, you just hate everybody, quite the contrary. We're sinners saved by grace, and it's our goal to reach other sinners so that they, too, might enjoy the grace of God. Yeah, and that's the storyline, I think, is uh, really just without grace, you can't move forward. And, and our characters in the story... You know, know that and understand that and learn that. 
Like we all learn that sometimes hard lessons and it doesn't come easy. But I just think this idea is we kind of close this idea of repositioning what a win is and having a win be faithful to God, trying as hard as you can. And if you lose the war, if you lose some battle, if you lose your business, if you lose this or that, the real side is God judging you saying, were you faithful in that situation that I put you in? And I think we've got to get back to, to, you know, carving out these plumb lines and teaching our kids that the standards aren't about winning and losing in the modern sense of what that is. The standards are being obedient. You're obedient and faithful or you're not. That's the story. And that's what we need from, from our kids. That's the way the next generation is going to make some progress back into changing our country. Well, thank you, Bill. I so appreciate the fact that God lit this fire in you. As a result, we keep getting these great audio dramas, and I buy up a bunch of them, and I give them as presents, and I give them as prizes. And when I know people are going to go on a long car trip, I say, here, and I want it back, so you're going to need to go buy your own (laughs) afterwards. (laughs) So just to refresh everybody's memory, how do they get a hold of this drama and other ones like it? Yeah, we don't have a central website, so we, we each one of them has little videos and so forth and, and trailer stuff on the site. So this one is uh, www.withleeinvirginia.com. Then there's infreedomscause.com and underdrakeslag.com. So you can go look at all those. Eventually, when I get the fourth one, I'll probably harmonize it. We'll have one page, one page to rule them all. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Bill, and I hope you're flooded flooded with orders. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always fun talking with you. God bless. Thanks.